Hello and welcome back to GG Weekend Watch, still kindly sponsored by Bet UK. We hope you have missed us. We have certainly missed talking to you, but we are back bigger and better than ever. Normal progress resumed, where I'm being joined by Daryl Carter and Andrew Mount yet again. And we are back for a good weekend as well, because it is Scottish Grand National Weekend. As well as that, we have some classic clues at New Brew of a couple of Group 3s. So we better get into the action. And we start up at air with the 115. This is a premier handicap chase for five runs and over. Over two miles and a half of furlong. As I say, up at air, 10 runners. So, Daryl, who wins our opener, please? Yeah, good to see both of your faces. <laughs> I have missed you both. Um, <laughs> yeah, get, getting stuck into this... Uh, I, I, I was keen on Fred Darms for Dan Skelton, but I was looking at more four to one than nine to four, to be honest. Um, he's a little bit short in the market for me to be going having a bet on. First time tongue tie goes on today. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed with him at Ascot. I backed him and tipped him at Ascot, and he was beaten five lengths by Black Jerry. But on reflection, I thought that was quite a nice run, actually. Um, he was coming back from a, a cut from a previous race at Newbury, been off the track for 128 days, and uh, he sluiced through the race. He really shouldn't have been benefited by being held up at the rear of the field in that contest. But he sluiced through the race and just sort of tired towards finish. I think he looked like he needed the run. Um, they put a tongue tie on. Perhaps he didn't need the run and perhaps he's got a few wind issues. But I was looking around more 4-1 to one than 9-4. to four. I do think he's the most likely winner. I think he's very well handicapped on his two previous runs. Beat bet, subsequent Betfair Hurdle winner Akon Risk over fences. Beat Haddix de Zobo at Kempton. Obviously, Balco Coastal was in the mix for those races as well. So his form is very strong. He's only a six-year-old and he's improving. I think he's the one that's got a bit of scope of his mark of 136. I think the market's got it correct. We'll pay the Piper in its second favourite. I would just have it a little bit tight, a, a little bit more open than nine to four, the field suggests. So Fred Arms, but no bet unless it's four to one plus. Yeah, unless he drifts out from that price. Like you say, currently priced up at nine to four, but you think that the market has got it right. Freya Darns from Pay the Piper for Daryl. So, Andrew, do you agree with that or where are you, where are you looking? Um, yeah, Pay the Piper's on my short list. I, I thought the field size beat him at Aintree. He tended to get crowded, drop back, um, came again, field of 13. He could um, really do with a sort of seven or eight runner field, I think. Um, but 10 is kind of borderline, so he's going to run a big race, I think. Red Rookie. He's another one who seems best in fields of seven or fewer runners. So, again, um, if, if one or two drop out, he'd have a squeak, but I'd probably take him on at probably a shortish price. Hasanki's the, um, the one I like if the ground is genuinely, you know, sort of softer than it was at, at Aintree. I thought he'd be in the first three or four again, and um, trouble was I was thinking he's going to be 10 to 1 plus. I've just looked at the prices. He's 13 to 2. Return ticket won it last year. Okay, return from a wind operation to uh, win last time out. Um, I think the old boy will run another good race. And Malistic, um, I, I thought it was a time of year thing with him. He tends to win from November to February. He has placed uh, second at this meeting for the last two years, but he is not from four in class one company. So I, I thought Malistic might you know, run sec second or third, but not win. Uh, I, was, I was struggling. I would go Hasanki each way because he's going to run his race. Uh, ideally, he needs it heavy, if not soft, if not good to soft. So it's kind of like at the uh, the worst end of his going spectrum. Not, you know, but uh, I still think he'll run well as he did at Aintree in the Red Run. What are we thinking again, of the out there, Kate? Is it going to be? Is it normally good ground at that time of year at that meeting? Isn't it? Yeah, it normally is. Like you say, it normally dries up rapidly, and especially at air, as we know, it, it's got such good drainage up there. Mm. But I haven't seen forecasts as such for there. But um, yeah, I'm, I was I was anticipating good. good. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was anticipating anyway. So whether or not that factors there's into a, there's a, a lot of rain convention. forecast. Uh, looking at XC weather, there's a lot of rain forecast for Saturday morning. Um, sort of up to 10, uh, well, on Saturday itself, sort of up to sort of seven or eight mil uh, in the morning. So it just depends if they get the uh, the higher end of that or not. Yeah. Oh, hopefully, for a few of my selections, hopefully they will get a bit of that anyway, because that could, that will really do me a favour. But your main play, though, Andrew, has Sankey for all that. He's probably another horse you were hoping to get a bigger price on in the end. Right, we are moving on to Newbury's opener. This is for Group 3, finest surprise stakes, otherwise known as for John Porter. Four four-year-olds and over, over a mile four at 1.30. Hurricane Lane makes his reappearance as a five-year-old now, but he is a short enough, uh, short enough price favourite for this. But, Andrew, is his price justified? Um, I don't think so on what he did last season in those two runs. Um, and, you know, you see a group one runner coming back in a sort of group three or listed race, first time out, 
bigger fish to fry later in the season, you know, might improve for the run, uh, even if he is trained by Charlie Appleby. So I'll, I'll take him on at that price. Um, Mojo Sty's not been the easiest to win with. He probably should have won more than he has. Um, I, can, I can see that one or two people will probably want to back him each way. Isra bombed out on heavy ground last time, having won on heavy ground the time before because it was the wrong sort of heavy ground last time. So it's, uh, it's a bit difficult to know what to expect with that one. Um, uh, Max Max Vega won this last year. He'd have a squeak. Well, I'm going to go with the other Rafe Beckett runner, which is Lone Eagle. Uh, first time blinkers, first run for the yard after leaving the Freddie and Martin Meads care. Now, um, Rafe Beckett's had two from this yard before. One of those was um, beating the head at nine to one in his debut. Got Dolphin Vista. The other one was third. And it's the blinker, blinkered angle that I like. Um, go back to 2016, he's, um, what is it, 23 from 103 with his first time. Um, blinkered runners, Posh Ralph. And uh, profit of 85, 23 to a one pound level stake. If you split those by running style, 22 of them made the running. 10 of them won um, for a profit of uh, over 45, uh, 49 pounds actually. So um, with Frankie Dettori on, um, I've been through the running styles briefly. He looks the only pace. You would think they're just going to you know, blinkers on, try and make all. So uh, yeah, each way trading, whatever your angle is, I'd be um, all over Lone Eagle here at 12 to 1. The posh Ralph. <laughs> is that what we're dubbing him now? <laughs> oh, you may get that pronunciation correct there, Mr. Mound, because he will not be happy with you. But you're going with the bigger price of the Rafe Beckett runners, Lone Eagle. Then 14 to 1, I can currently see in the first one blinkers, Frankie Dettori riding. Daryl, who are you siding with? Yeah, happy to take on Hurricane Lane here. Um, I thought his price was skinny enough, given he was only seen twice last year. Obviously, he had some issues. You've got to take a bit on trust to be taking odds on about him, I think. Look, he's he's beaten Mojo Star three times, um, or three of the four times that they've met. But I just want to take a chance on Mojo Star here. I think he's unexposed to an extent. This is probably a trip shy of his best, but soft ground would definitely help with that. Um, I think he's a smashing each way bet, really. He did finish ahead of Hurricane Lane in the derby, um, and he rounded out last year, albeit his first start of the year, so he obviously had issues. But... Uh, with a half length second to Kiprios at, at Ascot in the Ascot Gold Cup. Um, look, I think he, he runs his track well. I think it's very straightforward here. Nice long home straight for him to, to get wound up. Um, and I can see him picking up the pieces if Hurricane Lane is not at his absolute peak of his powers. And, and those peak of them powers were a couple of years ago now, really. I know I know he, he ran one in the arc in October, the end of the 21 season. But you do need to take a bit on trust uh, to back him at five to six. I think it'd be interesting to see which way he goes in the market. But uh, Mojo Star for me, I'll be taking him on with. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was glad we didn't get to see him at Nottingham when the ground just went against him there, didn't it, in that listed mm. contest prior to the off? Because I really thought going into that, he was going to be the the new stayer on the block to really throw it down to Trushan. And Trushan didn't really need any extra help with having someone throw it down to him anyway. <laughs> so this might well have been the plan of uh, Bojo Star take up this engagement. Then instead, we're back up north now to air for a novices or a... A, no, this is A, not the novices, champion handicap chase for five runs and over over three miles at 150. Looks an open enough contest here, though, Daryl. So who wins it? Uh, yeah, a bit boring, but I'm with City Chief for Nicky Henderson. Uh, I've liked this horse from day one, to be honest. Uh, he's just been sort of, he was a little bit frustrating at the uh, early part of last season, um, or the end of last season, rather. Um, he's just a young horse, inexperienced. He's improving with every single run. He can throw in a howler at his fences, but he recorded a really good time at Weatherby, even though it was a four-runner field. And I just think there's so much scope for improvement to come from him. Um, his point-to-point -point form looks pretty strong, and I think he's going to be quite a nice type going forward. So um, I'm willing to stick with him. I'm not convinced about any of the others in the field, really. So um, I, don't, I don't really want to back him, to be honest, at 9-4. to four. I think that's too short for me. But I do think he's the most likely winner. Yeah, play it with a straight bat. And he still looks like a horse where he's open to any amount of improvement as well. He's still he's just the slowest burner I think I've seen. Yeah. He still looks so green in his races, doesn't he? Kind of a big burly type where he's still doing enough wrong, but has managed to, to win those last two, despite, in my opinion, doing still enough wrong anyway. So City Chief playing with a straight bat for Daryl Andrew. Who do you like? Uh, I like City Chief as well. Um, I thought he had an obvious chance. He looks most progressive. Didn't like the second favourite, Sail Away, although that one's sixes into five since uh, the betting opened earlier this morning. He's had seven runs since leaving France and joining Dan Skelton. He's only won once. Um, that was when six to four on, making all at Warwick in a field of three. 
he's gone off short prices um, in many of his starts and got beaten. So I thought he was flattered by that front-running Warwick win. And I'll quite happily take him on. Uh, at a big price, Ned Tanner, I thought, might run some sort of race, um, provided there's a bit of rain around. He's got a good record at this track. Um, and I just thought he could be in the three or, you know, chase home the favourite if you're looking for a big price forecast. 16 to 1 about Ned Tanner. So, yeah, there's your one for the forecast. We're both in agreement in terms of the win about City Chief to bring up the hat trick. Right, we have a classic trial up next in the form of the Group 3. Fred Darling for Phillies, age 3, over 7 furlongs at Newbury at 205. Thousand guineas clues within this. A wide open renewal, I thought, um, really, which, I mean, personally, I wanted to keep experience on side in this race. It's an angle that we've seen to winning effect in recent years. Therefore, I'm siding with Swing Along to prove herself over this trip, as I don't think she'll have much of an issue over this distance, because when she won the Group 2 Lowther Stakes at York, she set a really good pace there, yet she still kept on in the finish to post a good time, but she definitely wasn't stopping at the line, and I thought at that point, oh, yeah, she'll, she'll get seven furlongs, no problem, but it made sense, therefore, that they would still go to the Group 1 Cheveley Park. But a race that she wasn't able to boss, and she still ran a solid race, set to high standard for the others to have to improve to meet. But, Andrew, who are you siding with? Um, I'm backing Get Out of Jail Free, uh, which is a card I'm playing here, because uh, this is the last race I looked at, and uh, I kind of got to uh, the number one horse, and it was time to start uh, recording. So... <laughs> Yeah, At least I'm, you're honest. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've not done enough work on this to warrant a selection. So uh, what was your selection again, Kate? Swing, um, swing along. Swing along. Like, so swing I, along, I, the experience yeah. angle. Yeah, you're, you're coming off a sub to to uh, play for me in this. You know, My knees have gone. Oh, God. Um, I can't last the full <laughs> 90 minutes. So uh, yeah, you, you're up. Swing along for me. I'm the Divock Origi of this podcast, am I? Super sub. Just ta tap me in then, Pope. Right. I'm in with Swing Along. No pressure, Daryl, but it's all on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I've not got a massively confident selection, but I've got an angle I like to, to follow and back. So I'll stick with that. I agree with you in terms of Swing Along and, and sort of Magical Sunset do set a, a fairly decent standard if they're going to run up to that on their seasonal return. So they'll probably be hard to beat. But I've had a bit of a stab at uh, Embrace for Owen Barrows. Um mm. I like um, I like backing Aaron Barrow's horses when uh, when Jim Crowley's on. I've um, got some few stats here for you. Uh, they got they got a twenty five percent strike rate on turf, right? Sixty winners from two hundred and forty when they partner at Newbury. They're eight for thirty four. They're massively profitable back eighteen pound to one pound level stake. Um, they've they've done it with Group One winners and they've done it with two year olds. So it, there's no real sort of um, niche sort of crop of horses that you should be backing when you back these two. Um, but if you did just back their three-year-olds, they're 17 from 50, 34% from their last 50 runners, £61 profit to £1 level stake. And those going from the all-weather to turf are 10 for 39. So I think they've got a massive, uh, a really good record. I think they're um, underestimated when they when they partner up. And I, and I don't know why they should be, because obviously they've got the, the record to suggest that they go well. This embrace won quite nicely at, at Wolverhampton. On her debut, she was a massive eye catcher behind um, Dancing Goddess, who's rated 96 at Kempton. She just greened his grass, didn't know what to do, and then just steamed home, loosing through the field. Um, I, I'm just quite interested to see how she goes in the betting, because... The record is hard to ignore of the, the trainer and jockey, and um, I'm always keeping an eye out for when Owen Barrows books Jim Crowley. So I've had a bit of a stab, four places on offer at uh, Embrace, and hoping probably some towards the top of the market sort of underperform at being their seasonal reappearance. I thought that um, your swing along and ma Magical Sunset between the two should have been clear favourites, really. Um, mm. But obviously, the Godolphin bl blue of uh, William Buick is a... Uh, heading up affairs of obviously because of this time of year so it's a given um, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> it's an absolute given as we'll be finding out potentially then this afternoon as well as we record 2 p.m then on thursday afternoon but yeah i i as soon as i saw the bridestone was in at her current price i just thought oh, surely that's worth taking on like say it's just connections why she is there but 25 to 1 about embrace and it's not even a horse in the Shadwell silks um, for Owen Burroughs and Jim Crowley here either. But yes, yeah, that's a plenty then to, to further bolster that claim for Embrace at a big price. Back to air now. We're on to the Scottish champion hurdle. A grade two listed handicap for four-year-olds and over. Over two miles at 225. A wide open contest this year. But Daryl, who did you land on? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Soaring glory for me. Um, obviously, he goes very well fresh. So I've been off 112 days. Uh, John Joe O'Neill seems to target specific races with this horse, as we see 
um, last season and the year before. Um, I, I just don't think he's had too much racing. And I think this is a good opportunity if they've got him completely right. He obviously ran over fences on, on seasonal return at Carlisle. That was just a, a blowout. He's not really a chaser. And then went back over hurdles at Newbury on deep ground, um, which I don't think he liked at all. Um, but it's good in the going description up here at the moment. Obviously, he doesn't want it too quick. But the last time he had that, he was uh, he was fifth in the Betfair hurdle. He's something like £13 better off with First Street. And uh, I think they've targeted this race. He's like he's unbeaten on the back of 50-day breaks or more. And I don't want to ignore that. I, I do like Colonel Mustard. Obviously, I put him up for the uh, more battle hurdle when he was just beaten by Benson. He suffered an overreach injury there. But I just felt like he should have put that to bed for me. And um, it was a little bit frustrating that he didn't. So I'm just hoping that Soren Glory has been targeted specifically at this. And uh, I think he'll get the job done, hopefully. 13 to 2 about Soaring Glory. To be fair, it looks like pretty fair prices about a whole host of these, but you're abandoning your Colonel Mustard in mm. the favour of the reappearing Soaring Glory on this occasion. Andrew, who do you like? Yeah, cracking race. Um, I had a short list of two and a half. The two are Soaring Glory because of his record when fresh, and Anna Bonina, a spring horse, of course, won this race last year and was second to Milkwood two years ago. Um, Milkwood hasn't done a great deal since then, but is obviously lowering the handicap as a result. Has been back from 20s into 12 to 1, uh, but I wasn't quite so sure. Now, Anna Benin has been ridden fairly prominently of late, uh, which won't be a good idea here because there's a whole stack of pace from you know, the likes of Royal Mogul, Paris, um, Paris Encore, Highway 102 and others. Uh, but when she won this last year, she came from midfield, so I'm hoping they re resort to those sort of tactics. Now, you know, the the half selection was Highway 102 because he did best of the prominent races in the county hurdle, finishing sixth at 80 to 1. First five came from um, midfield or further back, and he was two and a quarter lengths in front of Anna Benina's second best of the prominent races. Um, so, in the hope she's given a patient ride, just to be contrary to Daryl and not go for the same pick, I'll go Anna Benina. But I do respect Soaring Glory and say Highway 102, um, half a squeak as well. You've, ad you've abandoned Daryl's pick, but you sided with mine, <laughs> with Anna Benina. So <laughs> at least we've got a lovely bit of synergy going on here. Because, yeah, I, I think she'll win. Well, hopefully she'll win this race for the second year running. Currently a nine to one shot. And we know she comes good at this time of year, as you say. And I know that she's a lot higher this time around, £12 rather than running off the mark of 130 last year. Yeah, so sorry, sorry. Irish tax. Okay, so sorry to interrupt you, Kay. I, I meant to say also that, interestingly, her last, her best, her three best career racing post ratings have come in her last three starts. Um, you know, mm. she ran well at the DRF, she ran well um, at um, was it Punchestown, and then mm. she ran well on the county hurdle. And even though she's a spring course, it tends to be sort of April time that she peaks, and then in the summer, rather than a sort of, you know, March or so. She's, she's bet better than she was last year. I think her rate of improvement uh, exceeds the amount she's got up in the handicap as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm expecting even to be better. right. Even better, the fact she's actually been able to show that spring form even better than coming into this race. So hopefully there's going to be more from her and hope that Daryl caught that fly as well. <laughs> every time, every <laughs> time. Done. I never have any flies in it. And every time you press, we press record, there's just it one tiny little lot. one. Drives me sound that makes me look like a witch tramp, doesn't it? <laughs> it makes you look like you've got ninja reflexes anyway, because you seem to catch them every single time. Um, quick trivia question for you. Milkwood, why is that name clever? Why know. is that a clever name for the horse? Um, is it to do with the uh, what's the breeding? Oh, Dylan Thomas, in, in terms of the book, um, is it a book or a poem, a poem under uh, under yeah. Milkwood? Yeah. Yes, oh, well Lovely, done. Yeah. I know, I yeah, <laughs> I had a comment to to say it, and I thought, <laughs> I am going to sound clever now, <laughs> so well, very well done. You know, your poetry. Well, well, you, well you, um, spot, you spotted the connection. I, I, I this horse has been around for years and I've never put two and two together and made four. So. <laughs> He's now, what is he, now nine. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll continue to rinse that one for the duration anyway. Right, now we are back to Newbury. It's the return of the Colts over the straight seven furlongs here in the form of the Group 3 Greenham Stakes for three-year-olds at 240 at Newbury. Chaldean, a short price favourite here, Andrew, and it's an each-way price back the remainder. So how are you playing the Greenham? Yeah, this is a, f a fascinating race. And uh, although every time I think of like, you know, classic trials uh, I, I just think of Aidan O'Brien laughing when he watches them in, uh, in, in Ballydoyle kind of thing thinking I've got about 16 horses that are faster than this lot and uh, <laughs> I'm not worried about any of them but uh, let's just enjoy this for a race in its own right 
I mean, Cheldon is hard to knock um, after that fifth place on debut when running green. He's gone four from four. Although um, you, you watch the replay of his um, narrow win from Royal Scotsman uh, when I stuck the runner up last time out uh, in the Dewhurst. That was so gutting because Royal Scotsman was well drawn in seven. Cheldon had a fair draw in five, but Cheldon was the one who was first to the rail. And that's probably made the difference and he's won by a head. Now, in that race was Isaac Shelby, who had the worst of the draw in store, one towards the middle of the track, blew the start, ducked out to his right with nothing on his right-hand side. And although he finished well beat, you think you can draw a line through that and he might um, you know, run some sort of race this time for Brian Meir. And obviously, having won first time out last season, um, the, the absence shouldn't be a concern. Uh, Knight is one that I like as well. You know, um, I was quite taken with his debut win. At, uh, you know, it was only Yarmouth, but he's, uh, he's, he's done it from off the pace. Uh, and again, he's, he's also won from off the pace here at Newbury last time out, when I think the uh, you know the second, third and fourth were up with the pace throughout, as is often what you need. So uh, I thought there's plenty more to come from Knight this season. Um, the other one, um, say Isaac Shelby, Knight and Classic, I thought could all run well at big prices. Uh, Classic, again, his patient style um, isn't always ideal for this track, but he's um, still been running well here, coming from off the pace. Uh, a mile found him out last time out in a steadily run contest. I think that we have the winner in the second with one, two throughout, and he was just given too much to do. So hopefully there's a strong pace and, uh, you know, classic Knight, Isaac Shelby could all be sort of each way alternatives to Chaldean. Uh, I'll go for classic just because he's the biggest price, around about 33 to one. Yeah, I was going to say 33 to one then that you landed on. But just to mention, Isaac Shelby is currently 14 to one at a time of recording and Knight in there, a second favourite, still though in each way price at seven to one. So opposing Chaldean is Andrew Darrell. Are you likewise? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I, I, I like him. He's done nothing wrong, as Andrew said, but I just I'm not entirely convinced. I thought he clung on at Newmarket from Royal Scotsman, really clung on at the line. And um, I just don't know, he just might be a little bit vulnerable on seasonal return. Uh, I, like you can make some sort of case for a lot of these, to be honest. A lot of them are completely unexposed and winners. I thought the Riddler was interesting. Um, every time he's won, other than his Dover win in France last time, he put a line through that. He's looked like he wants much further than five furlongs. Um, I know he's bred for sort of six, five and six, but it just looks to me like he wants seven. And I think this is well worth rolling the dice with him. Obviously, Richard Farr, he won this last year with perfect power. Um, I think he's worth taking a little bit of an each way chance on, but it would only be a very small bet. I wouldn't want to get too deep and taken on Chaldean, although I do feel, feel like his rating is probably a little bit over or inflated a little bit. So, um, yeah, lukewarm on the favourite, perhaps a small each way bet on, on the Riddler. Yeah, still a betting angle into this race anyway, especially when it's 20 to 1 about the Riddler. And I'm going to stick with my boy, Knight adore this horse and we spoke about him plenty enough last year where I, I know Chaldean like you both said there hugely respect him and rightly so I think that he is odds on but would I still be wanting to side with him at that price on this return um no but I thought it was interesting with Knight when seeing entries at the start of the week that he was in the Craven but they've ended up going to this race um when I actually think Craven looks an easier race than this race. Uh, so I think that mm. they've actually selected the tougher option here. But it also makes sense, therefore, to send him back over the same course and distance. Two from two in his career, winning that Yarmouth maiden on debut. And as we always say, that Yarmouth form should never be underestimated. And then he powered through the heavy ground at Newbury in the Group 3 Horace Hill. And he's still green in that as well. And if he does get the soft again this time around, you know, he won't mind it. And hopefully it's going to be an even better three-year-old because I'm quite excited to see how he's progressed physically because he was always looked a big type of a horse. So hopefully we'll have filled that frame now. Oh, sorry, Andrew, I thought you were going to say something. Um, no. Right. <laughs> well, we'll head back to air then. I'll just take that as full agreement rather than anything else. Back to air now for the Group 2 future champion novices. Chase for five rolls and over, over two more four and a half furlongs at three o'clock. Just the seven runners here, Daryl. So we're more limited in terms of betting plays for this race, but how are you playing it? Oh, this is my nap in here, Kate. <gasps> yeah, yes. I, I think it's got a cracking chance. Um, I've been a big fan all season of That's All Right, Gino. Um, yeah, I you could, have. I could not believe the money. I didn't tip him at Cheltenham, but I could not believe the money was coming for him in the plate because that race just favours uh, those ridden prominently all the time. And he was mm -hmm. never going to be able to pick up in amongst a big field like that and, and, and come through. He can make the odd hash at the fence as well. So I just couldn't believe the money came for him, but it came in stroves and he went off five to one favourite for that. The time before at Kempton, I was tempted to tip him then, but I know that he jumped slightly out to the left. 
And I just thought that there was no pace in the race and that just could cost him. So we went with Solo, thankfully Solo won and he finished second. He stayed on really strongly. The time before at Cheltenham behind Stage Star, he had no right to finish second because it was Stage Star and Harry Cobden, as, as they've done all season, dictated the race from the front, set steady fractions throughout. And that's right, Gino held up, had no right to finish second the way he did. Um, and I thought it was a really impressive performance. I think this track is absolutely made for him. There's four fences in the home straight at air. So it doesn't let the front runners sort of get away from you too much. It's very hard to dictate races around there. And he will just have that long home stroke with four fences to be able to pick up. Smaller fields definitely going to suit him. The ground's absolutely perfect. I think everything is right for that's all right, Gino, in here. I'm not entirely convinced that Balco Coastal is the strongest stayer at two and a half miles. I don't think Thunder Rock wants two and a half miles. I think he wants three. I'm not sure what's going on with Unexpected Party, and I would be very, very disappointed if that's why Gino cannot get the job done here. This is his win. Bullish, bullish. And this is what we want on our return, is these sorts of bullish statements. And he has been a horse that you've been a fan of for a long time. I think we could all vouch for that, but hopefully his running style will be more suited this time around rather than his latest start. Andrew, any further bullish comments? I hope so. Yeah, hopefully the same horse. <laughs> this is a, cra a cracking contest. Balco Coastal's a funny old one, isn't he? In that um, he jumps out to his left, but he's only ever one right-handed. Although, um, given that it's all sort of Kempton Huntington form, it's possible that he just needs a flat track. So uh, I think air should suit, but you know, two to one, I'm quite happy to leave him alone. That's all right, Gino. Daryl makes a, a fine case, but here's a horse who's won once from his last 10 starts. So you, you can make excuses for some of those, but you're thinking, well, should he have won a little bit more than uh, he actually has? Uh, I disagree with Daryl about front runners at air. I think it's um, it's a massive front runners track uh, a lot of the time, particularly in the winter when uh, when the ground is soft, perhaps more so. Thunder Rock, uh, I thought he jumped better than he normally does over fences when he was sixth at Cheltenham. And, and again, he was ridden patiently when you wanted to be up with the pace. With only seven runners, um, you know, maybe he'll do a little bit better here. Um, was it um, yes? And unexpected party. He he was ridden patiently in the stage star race as well at Cheltenham last. Uh, sorry, the real whacker race as well. You look at that, the real whacker, uh, Jerry Colomb and the third Bron. They're all up with the pace throughout, and you know he was just you know too far back in a race that wasn't run to suit. It's a strange way they've campaigned, and you know because it looked for all intents and purposes as though he's being laid out for one of the handicaps of the Cheltenham Festival. So to see him rock up in that race and outrun his hundred to one odds, I thought was. Was very interesting. Richmond Lake's got a chance. I mean, he um, was Andy Holding, who keeps his own speed figures. Obviously, he was the um, you know, raving about him uh, after that um, um, run at air when he was second to one fine man. He was then stepped up to two and a half at Haydock. Uh, I know Andy napped him that day. All he did was drift, and uh, yeah, he's bolted up by four lengths. Clearly appreciating the return to two and a half. Um, he's actually entered um, over the same trip at air um, on Friday, though. But over the years, we've seen plenty of horses run twice in the, a few days in entry, and sometimes um, the Inval win twice. I was, I was just about to say I, the, the name escapes me. The Hendersons, of course. So um, Donald McCain this time. But yeah, if Richmond Lake um, does run here, um, do do keep an eye on him. Um, but it's I'll go unexpected party over Thunder Rock. Um, okay. But it's, it's one of those ones with, with seven runners. You know, it's it's going to be uh, maybe be a bit creative if you're having a play spot and um, you know try to have a few in against the favorite do we know why yeah. Bridget Andrews is riding and not Dan Skelton I thought he, Dan Skelton was uh, dropped up Harry that, got he? a bad fall there yesterday on Heltonham um at Cheltenham and um is he out for the week uh, yeah, and so he stood down for the remainder of his rise at Cheltenham yesterday so I just presumed that was why yeah. that makes sense yeah, injuries are plenty. Um, but yes, yeah, so interesting ways to play that race. For all that we didn't have the massive field, it's still a really, really intriguing contest at three o'clock at uh, three fifteen. Then at Newbury, we definitely have a betting heat here in the form of the Spring Cup handicap for four year olds and over over a mile at three fifteen. Eleven for the field, but beyond the favourite, it's an each way price about the remainder. So, Andrew, how are you side or who are you siding with? How are you playing it? There you go. Yeah, first off, what a disappointing turnout for the Spring Cup. Only thirteen runners. Um, Mm. You know, 10 years ago, there were 25 in this when Rafe Beckett won it with half a sixpence. 
used to be a great race for um, slagging off Jamie Spencer as he, um, you know, weaved in and out <laughs> the field and c- came there cruising only to finish second. So uh, that, that, he's on bless him. So uh, I suppose we, we might get uh, uh, an element of that anyway. Uh, the one I'm go- the one I'm one I'm going with is uh, another first time Blinkered Rafe Beckett runner, um, Jimmy Hendricks, who um, uh, ran um, in the uh, Lincoln last time out, thirteenth uh, behind Migration, had what turned out to be a tricky draw towards the far side, um, ran with credit, first run since being gelded, and I say the Blinkers go on this time, and we um, yeah, have twenty three from one hundred and three since twenty sixteen for the trainer in his headgear plus eighty five quid or thereabouts. And um, yeah, let's hope he's um, going to be ridden a little bit closer to the pace this time in the first time headgear. Brunch is one for your place parts. We, we know what he does. He, he he comes out from off the pace, travelling, finishes second most of the time as he did in his comeback. So he'll probably be there or thereabouts. But yeah, I just couldn't believe you know how poor a race it was compared. To, even though they boosted the prize money, I mean it's it's still not supersonic. Thirty six grand compared to seventy seven for the Lincoln. Uh, but it was like 25 grand, I think, last year or, or thereabouts. So it just shows you what's happening to some of these horses. They're going getting sold to Hong Kong and, um, you know, or Australia rather than running here. Yeah, exactly. Which is, sorry, state of affairs then, but it is the truth and you can't really blame connections for doing that. But your main play, though, Jimi Hendrix, for your mate, posh Ralph Darrell. Who do you like? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, Latam's obviously priced accordingly after that Irish Lincolnshire win last time. I mean, he came from a different parish inside the last couple of furlongs to win that. It was That was quite remarkable, really. Um, that was a massive step forward from anything he had done done previously. So it's not out of the question that he steps forward again 28 days later. Um, I was kind of looking at Saga, um, Atrium. Atrium is quite interesting. I listened to Charlie Fellows' podcast actually the other day. Um, he said that he worked the house down before his run in the Lincoln. And... Um, here and Schumacher reckons that he didn't like being crowded and uh, he spat his dummy out a bit. So I can see there'll probably be money coming for him. Um, Jimi Hendrix, interesting, as Andrew said, um, progressive horse last year has won twice, uh, second time out the last two years. Blinkers go on. But I didn't have, a, to be honest, Kate, I didn't have a strong opinion on the race. Um, so I've got no selection. Boring, aren't I? No worries. <laughs> that's that's absolutely fine. We've got plenty to cover, and we've definitely got a betting heat in our next race as well because it's our final scheduled race. It's the Scottish Grand National Handicap Chase, the Premier Handicap for five rods and over over four miles at three thirty five. Kitty's Light runs in this race again after finishing second in it last year off of a three pound higher mark. Uh, so evidently that makes him look well treated. But um, I'm going to kick us off if that's okay. So I like Elvis Mail. Currently priced up at 18 to 1 to hopefully double up on his success from last time out at Kelso when returned to fences after his first flight on seat at Cheltenham. But he rewrote that wrong then and he just looked to love the return to further and larger obstacles last time out. For all that, I think ultimately he prefers cutting the ground, hence why I alluded to earlier. I wouldn't mind a few showers in the morning, but he has previously run well at this track on good to soft ground so i'm not massively concerned and hopefully connections despite it being the end of the season if they had the concerns they just um won't run him uh but yeah he ticks plenty of other boxes to chance at a big price so it's elvis mail for me daryl but who are you siding with um under supervision just because i keep backing this horse and he keeps getting beat so i'm just i'm i'm just gonna <laughs> continue to, following him <laughs> i'm just gonna continue to go off that cliff now um there's <laughs> definitely a big pot in him and if not, so be it. <laughs> um, but obviously, I'm going to back Kitty's late as well. I think I just thought the, the run in the um, in the Ida was just remarkable. Really hitting nearly every single fence on the way round, still getting up to win was just so well handicapped. It's up eight pounds, like that eight pounds wouldn't have stopped him that day. It won't stop him today. Um, obviously, second in the race last year, as you mentioned, one forty is just a very fair mark. Christian Williams Williams is just a master at like plotting these horses when they get well handicapped and yeah, Umar to question him. Um I think Keith's like a win. I'm hoping from a good run from under supervision. <laughs> it's the end of the season. So if you don't keep following these horses off that yeah. cliff, well, then it's pointless, isn't it? Really? If you've gone the whole way round with them <laughs> through the whole campaign, you've got to stick with them, especially when they're 20 to 1 in a race of this nature. But I think, yeah, we're in agreement that Kitty's Light is most definitely the horse to beat. And he's Christian Williams, he's managed to do it again. Andrew's managed to get a horse that's well treated for this race. 
Yeah, it looks like he's done it again, doesn't it, with Kitty's Light. Um, he's one of four on the shortlist. Uh, the other is Mombeg Genius, third to Korak Rambler in the Ultima. That took his record on left-handed tracks to five wins, a third uh, and a fourth on his reappearance this season, his first run following wind surgery in a run that was probably needed. Um, so, uh, But again, his price is well covered, as is that of Kitty's Light. Um, I mean, Empire Steel, I thought the ground was too quick. Flower of Scotland's a Kelso expert. Elvis Mail, I thought might be best when fresh and wouldn't be here. I know that last week came after a recentish run, but he'd only got as far as the first at Cheltenham the time before. That's just my theory. I'm probably wrong. I usually am. Three under through five was interesting because he, he's one that I've been shouting at them all season to run him right-handed. thinking he could have made up to a King George performer because he's four from four when he goes right-handed. Um, although maybe it's just he, that he needs a small field and he's been running you know, in big field races at Cheltenham. He's been ran, ran in the you know, the Coral Gold Cup handicap chase at Newbury. Um, he's got the cheek pieces on for the first time. That's a positive angle for horses from the Nichols Yard who are out of the frame on their previous start. So, you know, I've seen it before with the horses. They look like they need small fields. When the pieces go on and they can't, they're not quite as, you know, worried by what's around them. Um, but, you know, that can help. So sort of sneaking suspicion that he might run some sort of race despite going left-handed again. Under supervision, I thought he needs a field of seven or fewer runners. He's naught from seven and fields of eight plus. But then he's a big price, and you know, um, um, it's, it's a race Nigel Twist and Davis has done well in before. Magnus Sammy's got to go right handed. Famous Bridge is the other, uh, the third on my shortlist. Three from three going left handed in the spring. So uh, he could go well at a big price. Uh, and the other one, half interesting, is Half Shot. Um, 50 to one, stamina doubt, but he ran well last time. He's had six runs in March and April, um, and he, he's been in the first three in all six of them, winning once. So. Uh, yeah, if you want a couple of big prices, have a look at Famous Bridge and Half Shot. But it's hard to get away from that pair at the front of the market, particularly kiddies. Yeah, I think we are all in agreement for that. And you know what, I, I, I won't even be discouraged whatsoever if he does go and goes on better in this race than he did last year, because I just love that operation with the Christian Williams scene. But a couple of good, um, really big price I mean, horses then for Andrew. Just look at our sponsors, Bet UK, a fifth of the odd six places. So you can back those four. Um, and a couple more. Yeah, and, and a few more just to add into the mix as well, as we've given you those extra few as well. So you're very welcome. But yeah, extra places on offer. So do make sure you utilise that. Right, Andrew, I head back to you, please, for anything from anywhere else. Yeah, the uh, the 4.55 at Newbury on Saturday. Warning sign for Gary Moore. Um, stepping up to 10 furlongs. This one ran in the, um, the, sp um, the Spring Marble Lincoln Consolation Race. And of course, by the, when they ran that race, we didn't know if there was any, you know, any draw bias at all at uh, Doncaster, we could only guess. Turned out there was a massive one. And if you were on the far side, you were really in the swamp. Now, only four horses stayed in that uh, on the, in that far side area, stores one, two, three, and four. Uh, and they pretty much finished out with the washing, although warning sign was 10th, uh, beaten 11 lengths. He's finished something like, was it 30, uh, 30 lengths ahead of the next one of that quartet to race on that far side. That was Isla Kai, who went off the 9-2 nine, nine favourite. I thought it was a huge run. That was his first start since being gelded. He was ridden by a £7 claimer. Uh, well, he's ridden by another one in Tom Queeley, you could argue here. But, uh, yeah, um, so, or a £6.5 claimer. I'm being unfair there. But, uh, I mean, um, previously, um, was it in... Uh, when he was trained in France, he has won over a mile and a quarter and been campaigned up to a, an extended mile three. So, um, yeah, fourth run for um, Gary Moore. Drawn one. That can be handy over 10 furlongs at Newbury. I'll go warning sign. Warning sign in the 4.55 at Newbury for anything from anywhere else for Andrew Darrell. Anything for anywhere else for you? <laughs> oh, can't hear you. The, the fly, oh, the fly's got me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was warning sign in the 455 at Newbury, and in the same race, Mustazid again, Mustazid, another one that I've been going off a cliff with. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I totally agree with everything Andrew said. It was eye popping the run at Doncaster last time from on the wrong side of the track, and it was just went down in my notebook as one to keep a very close eye on next time. So, yeah, um, I'm not too sure about the trip, but I thought it was interesting. The same in the same race, Mustazid. This horse is better than 77 on a going day, I'm telling you now. But whether or not he is on a going day is another question. I haven't seen any prices for the race, so that's why I can I, I sort of can't. I haven't put any of them on my column because I can't, you know what I mean, work out the race yeah. without the prices. So. 
Yeah, exactly. Especially in a race of that nature with 18 runners to go to post as well. We don't have prices, but at least you're both in agreement uh, with the one with warning sign. But then you're also shoving in mustard seed as well. But do make sure you wait for prices. Daryl, I'll go back to you, please, for your nap. Yeah. Um, uh, three o'clock air. That's right, Gino. Perfect. Just to reiterate, like I say, you did make it known at the time that he was going to end up being your nap. Andrew? Um, I was going to go warning sign, but I haven't seen any prices yet. So he could be seven to two. He could be uh, he could be twelve to one. So I'll go for Lone Eagle at uh, Newbury. That's in the one thirty, and I hope they just blasts off in the first time blinkers and makes all. The posh Ralph, wonderful. Uh, I was between Anna and Swing Along. I'll go Anna Benina in the two twenty five at air in the Scottish Champion Hurdle for my own nap. Right, that is everything from us on a jam pack show. A big thank you to Daryl and to Andrew for all of their hard work. Thank you so much to you for joining us again. Best of luck with your bets this weekend and enjoy the action. Mm -hmm.